Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session on sustainable business travel, turning ambition into action. My name is Delphine Milo, and I'm heading our sustainability program at GBTA, the Global Business Travel Association. Today, I'm joined by Jenny Sabine, chair of our GBTA sustainability committee and manager travel services at Salesforce. Jenny, it's a pleasure to have you today and discuss this exciting topic with you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Uh, so yes, our objective for today's ses session is to understand how we can close the gap between intention and action when trying to implement more sustainable business travel practices. Greening travel and reducing emissions is front of mind for most travel managers. And we did our own research as well as GBTA and found that 89% of buyers globally are saying that sustainability is a priority for them. However, when we break it down to regions, uh, so 97% of Europeans are claiming it as a priority and that um, data is a bit lower for Americans with only 84%, which is still high, but still lower than Europeans. So Jenny, I guess these results are not really surprising as we know that Europe has always been leading the way on climate action, but do you think that the US is also starting to pay more attention? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think it's no secret that COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, bringing a world to, the world to a screeching halt really kind of made everybody stop and think um, as we had to quickly shift to virtual work environments, and, you know, at Salesforce, you know, we, we always knew that travel emissions was a mountain that we needed to climb eventually, but it was just kind of hard to know when to intervene being, you know, when do we start that process as a sales driven customer centric company um, that has always really valued that face to face interaction to build trust. But as I said, you know, during the pandemic, you know, we seize this opportunity to rethink what travel could look like on the other side, as I think many companies in the US did. Um, and, you know, I think we're seeing more U.S. companies now adding sustainability or ESG as, you know, a core pillar or value of their company. Um, and I know, you know, at Salesforce, we did that actually this year. We just officially added sustainability as a core value of our company next to trust, customer success, innovation, and equality. Um, and when we add a value, we operationalize it in every area of the business. And so I, I do think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that and have across the U.S. Okay, thank you, Jenny. And you mentioned a few key terms. Uh, in addition to sustainability, you referred to, to the ESG pillars. We're hearing a lot uh, of buzzwords, and uh, it can be just a little confusing or overwhelming at times. Uh, sometimes we hear about like the 17 sustainable development goals set up by the United Nations. Obviously our ESG pillars are environment, social and governance, lots of discussions around carbon neutrality, the race to net zero. Um, in just like all that jungle of terms, <laughs> what should be really like the priority of travel managers? Where should they focus or their actions? I mean, right now, I would say the priority needs to be climate action as it has a timestamp and we're really running out of time. I mean, all of the everything you're hearing now is talking about how, you know, there's no sign of growing back greener um, and the disruption to our, our climate and planet is already worse than we thought. So, I mean, really, we're in a position at companies and as travel managers to take action and do what we can today to make a difference on climate action, which will definitely you know, have other effects on the social pillar as well. Um, you know, at Salesforce, we always talk about, you know, we believe business has the, the trust and resources and potential to be the greatest platform for change. And for travel managers, this really means considering the impact of business travel and corporate travel policies on our planet, um, you know, and, and our people as well, which, you know, dives into equity, social in inclusion, fair labor, for example. So really, you know, considering where, why, how we travel, you know, making trips more purposeful. I think we we play a huge role in, in climate action today. 
Okay. Yeah, no, and this really covers very well why uh, travel managers should care. And even if the task is overwhelming and everything is related, there is a big role for travel managers. Although they are still wearing many hats, we're still asking them to manage costs and, and to juggle with a lot of competing priorities. So if you could just boil it down to like, why should travel managers care? What would you say? Yeah, definitely. And I actually, I, I, I wanted to share a couple of stats because I think that this really brings more light as to why there's so many eyes on business travel and why we should care. Um, you know, business travel accounts for 15 to 20% of all global travel and is a significant contributor to global greenhouse gas emissions. The aviation sector alone accounted for 2.5% of global emissions in 2018. And the international aviation produced over 4% of total global CO2 emissions in 2019. 91% of business travel emissions come from air. And I can tell you that the majority of our business travel at Salesforce also comes from air. So, I mean, those are big stats to think about like how, you know, what we manage um, within a travel program really has direct impacts into, on the climate and on the planet. Um, also, there's, you know, recent like the SEC, you know, proposed climate disclosures last month. Um, you know, that's in the, our, you know, disclosing our, um, you know, climate related risks really do have material impacts on business operations and, you know, investor decisions. And in California, where I'm based, um, in January, the California Senate passed the very first Climate Corporate Accountability Act. And this basically requires us to disclose annually our emissions from all scopes, including business travel. So whether we want to or not, you know, we are going to be asked and, you know, companies are starting to ask us to track and reduce emissions. So the way we see it, um, you know, travel managers have a very critical role to play in tracking and reporting emissions. And, you know, at, at the same time, nudging our employees to make greener choices. And also, you know, what we're seeing too, you know, more employees are aware of their own footprint and they want to travel in a more sustainable way. And they're asking, you know, what are we doing about it? Um, so it's about meeting the needs and demands of our employees as well. Okay. Yeah, so definitely there will be no choice around it. It's not whether travel managers should care, but they, they must care. Um, now I just, because this event is called Think, and uh, this encourages us to be maybe a little bit uh, provocative. Uh, and I wanted to address uh, the elephant in the room uh, because sometimes there seem to be, you know, contradiction between like travel and emissions reduction. Um, and even, you know, uh, we've seen corporations announcing that they will not resume business travel to pre-2019 levels just to keep their emissions under control. Uh, and again, like our own research at GBTA showed that 73% of buyers think that reducing travel frequency should either be encouraged or mandated as part of a green business travel program. So Jenny, what, what's your take on this? Are there any better alternatives and can we really reduce emissions without reducing travel? Well, I mean, it's obvious that travel habits cannot return to pre-pandemic levels. So, you know, that 2019 level, um, you know, as I mentioned, we did seize the opportunity over the last two and a half years to rethink what travel could look like on the other side of this. Um, and, you know, while we promote a work from anywhere culture at Salesforce, um, we enable virtual collaboration, you know, through tools like Zoom and, and Slack, um, but we're also trying to help define what purposeful travel looks like and supporting some level of reconnection with colleagues um, and customers. So, you know, business still needs, needs travel and travel can and should be done in a sustainable way. So it's really our job to dig into the data, define what purposeful travel looks like for our companies. Um, and really, you know, we need to become comfortable measuring travel emissions for every travel transaction and how and where we can avoid and make reductions right away. Um, I think the real question, again, for our industry is how do we make sure that travel is purposeful? Um, you know, and you have to focus on enabling that virtual collaboration as well so that, you know, for the times that, um, you know, we are not traveling, you know, we, we shouldn't assume that employees, you know, enjoy working this way or know how to work this way. I think, you know, one thing that I've really appreciated about what Salesforce has been doing during this time where, you know, we're trying to figure out how to work virtually is, you know, we're, we're kicking off things like async weeks and, you know, doing Slack foundational training so that we can share across the company tips and trips 
to uh, tips and tricks, you know, to really support and enable employees to work on their own time and to, to work, be successful in a virtual environment. But again, we know that some level of face-to-face, -face, you know, still is needed. Okay. Yeah, no, that's very valid. That it's not about yeah, volumes of travel, but really about traveling better and making sure that uh, this travel is bringing yeah. value to the corporation and to the employees. Yeah. So, yeah, since the topic of our session is turning ambition into action, now I wanted to dive into the action part. Uh, and let's talk about, you know, impact and concrete steps uh, that travel managers can take to integrate sustainability in their travel policy and also nudge employees to choose greener options. So I was wondering, what do you see as the key levers to actually influence travelers' behaviors? Yeah, I would say, you know, the first step really starts with just awareness and education, um, you know, and a lot of that comes from, you know, getting the data that you need um, as a travel manager to know what to make employees aware of and, and what to educate on. So, I mean, on our, in our journey that we started, you know, a couple of years ago, when we got together with our sustainability team to decide, you know, what is our short, medium and long term goal on this, this journey to net zero? And we landed on kind of one of the, the foundational starting point was with our policy. Um, so we really dug into the policy. It was a seven month labor of love, I would say, that was a collaboration across several teams, not just sustainability. I mean, it was, you know, our quality teams, accessibility, our finance and strategy teams. Um, and really, you know, we incorporated sustainability more boldly into our policy. Um, you know, I would say sustainability is, has really deepened our partnerships across several teams with, you know, internally. Um, and once we, you know, included, um, you know, this sustainable guidance into our policy, it was all about, you know, communicating that and getting it in front of employees, because how often do we find employees aren't really sitting down and reading the policy. Um, so, you know, whether it's through, you know, a po your policy or a comms or enablement campaign, um, you need to make employees aware of their impact and how the company, you know, how Salesforce or your respective company and travel program can recommend and support travel be traveler behavior shifts. Um, you know, some quick tips, you know, that we included in our policy would be like around consolidating trips, um, you know, when flying, book direct, book economy, you know, try to avoid short haul and, you know, shift, mode sw shift where you can. Um, we did not have a robust rail policy um, or program pre-pandemic, and that's something that we've been very laser focused on. Um, you know, we're lucky at Salesforce that we travel to destinations where rail is a viable alternative. Not every company has that opportunity, but, you know, I challenge you to, you know, take a look at where mode switching could um, help your program and help reduce your impact. Um, you know, I mentioned it before, data, data is king. Um, partner with your TMCs gather and dig into the data to again, define what purposeful travel looks like for your company and then communicate that. Um, so I would say, um, you know, definitely if there's any questions about that, I'd be happy to, you know, if anybody wanted to reach out, I'd be happy to share what we put in our policy. Yeah, now that's already pretty impressive. And uh, so in addition to all of the data tracking and also all of the nudging, we've also seen companies like adopt quite drastic measures such as like carbon budgets and carbon fees. Uh, what do you think are those? Are you going down that route as well? I mean, we're definitely, we, we've been hearing it too. We're definitely exploring it. Um, you know, we, we see how it could be a powerful enablement and tracking lever, um, but we've found that it's incredibly difficult to implement um, in practice. I mean, I know everybody's watching this space, but you know, as an example, you know, offsetting does, it does place an internal cost on carbon. Um, so, you know, for example, travel teams, you know, they don't really typically have budgets. Um, you know, our entire operation are run off of travel transaction fees. So, you know, a carbon fee, you know, could help funding future green investments like sustainable aviation fuel, for example. You know, if you could tack a fee, for example, onto a booking transaction, so that those that are actually doing the, the travel for business could help fund, um, you know, a sustainable aviation fuel investment and program to, you know, reduce offsets, then that would be great. But, you know, again, it's harder to implement in practice than it sounds. Um, but these are the questions we're starting to ask ourselves for sure. Yeah. 
Now, and it comes also with many questions such as where to set the price for carbon. But as you say, at the end of the day, probably the success of these practices comes with a lot of communications with employees and making sure that uh, the funds collected go towards uh, like uh, yeah, positive initiatives that also mobilize employees uh, around, the, around the topic. Yeah, um, yeah. One more issue uh, that is on the um, employee side uh, where we've seen a lot of press and also sometimes some contradictions at, as to their effectiveness is carbon offsets. Uh, and everything nature-based solutions. I know it's a topic that you're very active on uh, as well. Um, do you think that there are uh, valid mechanisms for employees to compensate emissions uh, from their travels? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. At, at Salesforce, we have an entire nature-based solution team dedicated to this. But um, yes, I mean, we see this as a bridge to the future. It's not a substitute by any means um, for drastic emissions reductions, but we look at it in terms of this hierarchy. You know, first avoid, avoid all unnecessary travel. This goes back to, you know, digging into your data, defining what purposeful travel looks like for your specific company you know, and enable and encourage that remote collaboration. Again, back to what I was saying, you know, don't just think that everybody works magically virtually. You know, this is something that you really have to take the time to, you know, dedicate and enable your employees to do that. Um, and the next would be reducing. So reduce emissions from unavoidable travel, um, you know, using those low carbon modes of travel, like, like rail, for example. Um, and then, you know, the communication and increasing employee awareness around travel emissions and way to reduce. So again, data is king um, in, in the ability to reduce. Um, and then lastly, offset and invest. So anything remaining, you offset with the high quality nature-based solutions, which is why we have an entire team dedicated to this. Mm -hmm. um, and then you want to invest in future reductions and long-term solutions like sustainable aviation fuel. This is largely why Salesforce made the decision last year um, during Earth Month and Happy Earth Month to um, invest, to become a founding member of SABA, which is the Sustainable Aviation Buyers Alliance. Um, we really wanted to take part in that conversation and send the demand signal to the market and make sure that we you know, are helping build out that market infrastructure that does not exist today. Um, and we've been working with our suppliers as well to you know, explore direct investments um, in sustainable aviation fuel. Um, you can see our climate action plan. It's, it's publicly available um, on the Salesforce website. But um, in that plan, you know, our, you know, our public goal is to reduce our 50%, reduce our emissions intensity by 50% over this decade relative to 2019. And in our climate action plan, you know, we attribute about 45% of that to our digital first, you know, work from anywhere culture that we've been building um, and, you know, the changes to our t &E policy. We attribute about another 5% to mode switching. And so that goes into, you know, rolling out our robust rail policy, which is still a work in progress. But the remaining three to, I'd say, 20%, we really feel like is going to come from smart investments and green innovations like sustainable aviation fuel. So it's really a combination of the three. So it's not just about offsets, but um, still, still an important piece. Okay. Yeah, and it's reassuring to know that uh, to tackle this issue, there are actually several levers, and you just gave us a very good overview of a lot of levers that exist on the demand side and what employees can do to just like shift to like more sustainable travel options. I also wanted to talk a bit about um, the procurement exercise and the supply side, uh, because as you indicated, it's a mix of both, it's like actions on demand, but also actions made from suppliers. Uh, and again, to uh, pull a few stats uh, from our research and our more recent study. Um, so we've, show, we've uh, found out that only 26% of buyers are attaching a lot of importance to green certification and credentials uh, when selecting suppliers, uh, which is a little surprising because, you know, talking to our members, we actually see a lot of interest uh, from buyers to start integrating such criteria when selecting their partners. And we're talking about airlines, hotels, like rent transports, and even TMCs. So, Jenny, why do you think that this number isn't higher? Like, are there some challenges faced by buyers when trying to select suppliers based on their like sustainability practices? 
Yes, um, definitely. And I kind of laugh because, you know, it, two years ago when we, again, first, when our, when our relationship with the sustainability team went from like, you know, it used to be just this one annual transaction of giving our travel data, and then we would say, see you next year. Um, but, you know, again, as of two years ago, you know, the collaboration deepened and, you know, one of, in addition to the policy, one of our first projects to tackle was, well, this seems easy. We'll just add some, you know, add sustainability questions into our hotel RFP, which was the next, you know, kind of sourcing, op you know, project that was coming up. Um, and, you know, it was, we were really excited about it. We collaborated with the team, you know, received a, a select number of questions that we added as like a supplemental survey to the RFP. Um, you know, well, of course, we were not the only company that thought of this, right? So every company had their select set of questions. I'm sure some of them were similar across different companies, but, you know, now the suppliers are receiving multiple sets of questions from multiple companies. Um, you know, we're getting all of the information back. And the first thing we realized is that it was not as easy to identify a green supplier as we thought it would be. Um, you know, everybody did a great job of completing the survey, but we realized there were a multitude of certifications, you know, whether they were US based or global, um, you know, it was hard to kind of decide um, what, you know, what would make one hotel or airline for that matter, or car supplier more sustainable over another when there's so much fragmentation and many different certifications and green credentials out there. It was just very difficult to navigate. And so, you know, here we have all of this data now. And the other part was, should we have, you know, if we had, you know, decided, okay, well, we're going to decide on, you know, these green credentials, and this will be the Salesforce specific criteria that we'll measure suppliers on. And if we wanted to then go into our online booking tool and prioritize, you know, that group of hotels, for example, as the most sustainable, that was difficult to do as well. Um, so the technology wasn't really quite there, at least the technology we're using today to, you know, prioritize or even flag one hotel over another. Um, so we realized at that moment that, you know, we kind of needed to maybe take a step back. You know, we certainly want to keep collecting this information and have that information at our fingertips. But, um, you know, it's one of the reasons why I was inspired to join the GBTA Sustainability Committee before I even stepped into the, ch to the chair role, because just realizing that there was so much work to be done and that we really needed to collaborate and work together across, you know, companies and suppliers. And, you know, I, I felt bad for our hotel suppliers. It was like, that was, that's a lot of work for them. And, you know, and then we're not doing anything in return. So, you know, it's really important that we harmonize, you know, initially just a list of sustainability attributes and criteria or questions that we could use, you know, to eventually benchmark our suppliers um, and, you know, prioritize suppliers. So we know that that's important. And I'm excited that, you know, GBTA, you know, is partnering with other organizations that are already, you know, working on this. And so, um, you know, for us, you know, when we went down that road and realized, okay, so, you know, maybe this, this is the credentials and, and the harmonization isn't there yet. Um, so for us, you know, we kind of pivoted to, um, you know, another initiative that we already had ongoing, which is including a sustainability exhibit in our contracts. Um, we released that again last um, Earth Month, so last April, um, and it's basically, you know, a public facing document. So we've kind of released it as a blueprint that other companies can provide. But um, it's basically our, our way of, you know, collaborating with our supplier partners on setting their own science based targets. And so for us, you know, incorporating that exhibit um, and having that level of collaboration in the short term was or even, you know, short to long term, you know, is kind of one way and one lever for us to utilize to identify, you know, a more sustainable supplier or, you know, praise one of our suppliers for sustainability. So that's, you know, somewhat of our short medium goal right now, um, but uh, definitely, you know, staying close to the space and excited about, you know, helping move that harmonization forward for our industry. Yeah. And I love that you use the word collaboration, because usually when we talk about procurement, there's not a lot of collaboration going on. But when it comes to sustainability, uh, it's really about partner partnering between the buyers and the suppliers to try to yeah, like make all of the efforts that can be made. Uh, and this could also cover costs because this is also a topic that I know um, is actually one of the biggest barrier actually towards the uptake of like greener business travel option is often cost. 
uh, mm -hmm. because green travel options come at a premium uh, mm -hmm. and require significant investments from suppliers. So do you see any opportunities and any collaboration to be driving this cost down? I know that you already referred to the great work uh, that is being done on the sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, maybe can you expand on that uh, example and are there any other areas where actually uh, sending a demand signal could help uh, drive the costs down? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, this was, you know, one of the reasons why we, you know, decided to be one of the founding members of SABA, the Sustainable Aviation Buyers Alliance. Um, you know, we knew and saw and, you know, collaborated with our, our peers and understand how, you know, participating in that conversation and making those investments, those early investments are really what's going to send a demand signal to the market, to fuel producers. And that is what's going to drive the cost down. So it's the one way we were able to, again, we do not have a budget um, as a travel team and most travel teams don't. So that's the difficult piece of, you know, of course, everybody wants to drive that demand signal, but how do you, how do you come up with the funding? And so, you know, utilizing that vision um, of, you know, sending that demand signal and, and driving that cost down, driving that transparency is what really allowed us to, you know, sell that to our leadership. Um, and then I also think even with things like, you know, the rail program, for example, like, sure, there are times where there might be, you know, a rail journey that might cost a little bit more than your air journey would have, but it's all about that communication and enablement. Again, at the end of the day, what maybe they're not seeing the employee or even leadership or those hidden costs of, you know, that difference between the rail journey and air could be the cost of transportation to and from the airport. So, you know, really digging into the details and understanding the full scope of it. And again, you know, sending that demand signal, you know, around electric vehicles, you know, that is another part of our ambition is to, you know, electrify, electrify our, our fleet over the next decade. Um, and car companies and rental companies need to know that, that this is something that's on their customers' minds. Um, and it's not just about the electric vehicles, it's about the charging infrastructure as well. Like how can we partner with our hotels and even our own real estate, our office buildings? Um, so these are all conversations we're definitely having and it's all a part um, of our climate action plan. And it's all, you know, again, a part of that sending the demand signal to drive the transparency and, and eventually the costs down. But we all need to, to work together to do that. It's gonna take everyone. Yeah, no, it will. And uh, we can also look at uh, financing the transition outside of just industry stakeholders. And uh, partnerships could also involve like public um, authorities and governments to also help build the system of uh, yeah. incentives or tax cuts for these changes to, to happen. So it's also important to signal that uh, beyond businesses, like there are other stakeholders that could also help make sure that uh, the cost of the transition doesn't fall on consumers as well to be yeah. picking those greener options. Yeah. And Jenny, before we close our session, uh, what would be your final words to our audience today to make it less daunting and a little easier mm -hmm. to grasp all of these issues and actually take action? Yeah, well, I would just say that, you know, everyone's path to net zero is a journey and every step counts and everyone's path to net zero might look a little bit different. So it's really important that we share our learnings and that, you know, we share our ideas and outcomes. Um, and I would say, you know, don't get discouraged, get curious, get educated and get inspired, um, you know, join GBTA join the conversations. We're bringing a lot of great educational content around this. Um, we have a great committee of um, subject matter experts dedicated to this and um, also hoping to re be releasing some more tangible, actionable tools. Um, I would say some of the most important things I've done that have helped me is just benchmarking and collaborating with my peers across the industry. Um, you know, not recreating the wheel. You don't have to just get involved and ask a lot of questions. Um, there's really a lot to learn. And, you know, we need everyone's help and questions and insights. So there isn't one solution. It's, you know, critical that we follow and strategies. Um, and so, you know, we all need to get comfortable as, as well. I would say measuring um, emission reductions right away. So, 
that is definitely something I would take away and start working internally or with your TMC or again, you know, collectively across the year with your industry peers. But um, lastly, I would just say, feel free to reach out to me. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, if you want to stay updated on our progress at Salesforce, you know, we have released a climate action plan and a white paper um, that I helped draft. So um, all of that is at salesforce.com backslash sustainability. Um, but again, feel free to reach out to me. I'd, I'd love to collaborate with you. And thanks for having me today. Thank you, Jenny. It's been such a pleasure to interview you. Thank you for being such a great ambassador and advocate, you know, for like uh, leading positive change uh, within our sector and also leading our sustainability committee at GBTA. Uh, I hope that our audience now feels empowered to make headways uh, when it comes to making business travel more sustainable. Uh, and for more information and content, you can actually search the word sustainability in the Think platform. So thank you everyone for tuning in and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.